This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. It's September 1946, about one year after the end of the Second World War. Annie Carroll is at her house in Manor Road in Cheen Village, Surrey, England. A few days earlier, she had posted a notice in the newspaper about her son, Patrick Heenan. It was in a section labelled Active Service, which listed information about men who'd been killed, injured or gone missing in the war. This is a time before Facebook, and newspapers were the best way of letting the wider community know about those sort of things. It read, Patrick Heenan, previously reported missing. Now officially presumed dead in Singapore, on or about February 15th, 1942. No letters, please. But despite asking for no letters, a postcard arrives in Annie's letterbox. It's unsigned. There's no return address. It doesn't give any details about how or why Patrick died, but it ends with these words. He has no grave, other than a watery one. All very chilling and mysterious, Also, seems like a pretty nasty thing to send a grieving mother to tell the truth. But what that grieving mother seems not to have known is that her son, Patrick Heenan, was a traitor. There's something else interesting about this postcard. It mentions that Patrick died on Friday the 13th of February, 1942. That date is significant. Black Friday, the day it became obvious the British-controlled city of Singapore was going to fall to Imperial Japan. One British survivor wrote this about Black Friday. Everyone aged 10 years in that day. It was a day of utter hell. This particular day we had the Japanese at their most ferocious and all anyone could do was to keep a shred of sanity and try and help out where it would do some good, among the fires and the rubble. There were parts of the city we hardly recognised and it was at this time we got some idea of what had been happening in Europe for the last couple of years. For several days past, our troops have been struggling back from the northern parts of Singapore, exhausted and demoralised, without leaders, many of them in a kind of permanent shock. They wandered about the city, sitting in their dozens on the steps of the buildings. All organisations seem to have collapsed. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill described the fall of Singapore as the largest capitulation and worst defeat in British military history. And, at least according to some stories, a New Zealand-born traitor from the British Indian Army played a big part in that defeat. Captain Patrick Heenan, son of Annie Carroll, born on the west coast mining town of Reefton in 1910. A biography of Heenan, Odd Man Out, the story of the Singapore traitor, describes him as... An officer whose treacherous activities played a significant part in the Japanese victory. Although the Japanese would still have taken Malaya without his assistance, the information he provided, particularly about aircraft movements, helped their two-month blitzkrieg immeasurably. So that book, Odd Man Out, is fascinating and compelling and we're going to rely on it a lot in this episode, but it's also based on some fairly thin evidence. Sometimes all there is to go on is, well, rumours. And unfortunately, rumours are the best sources we have for parts of Heenan's story. That's because the fall of Singapore was such a chaotic disaster that very few documents or eyewitnesses survived. Classic example, the guy who tells the best story of how Patrick Heenan died is a doctor who treated him in prison. But 
This doctor wasn't actually there when Heenan died. He heard the story secondhand three months later in a POW camp from another guy, a British Army sergeant who apparently was there. And this doctor didn't tell his story until 1992, nearly 50 years after Heenan died. In previous episodes of Black Sheep, we've had to deal with murky stories, but I'll say up front, this is the murkiest story I've come across in this series. It will always be one of those fascinating cases, and I I like to use it as a teaching case with my students because it raises all kinds of vexed questions on all kinds of levels, including, for example, sources. What sort of conclusions can you draw in all fairness with limited sources. Uh, uh, How much license should you be given to surmise? That sort of thing. This is Brian Farrell. He's a military history professor at the National University of Singapore. I spoke to him over a slightly dodgy Skype line, so sorry about the quality of the audio. Anyway, let's properly introduce today's black sheep. Patrick Heenan was born in the South Island mining town of Reefton in 1910. In those days, Reefton was a Wild West kind of place. The gold rush of the 1870s and 80s were over, and this town, which had been the first place in the entire Southern Hemisphere to have a public supply of electricity, had started to decline. By the time of Patrick's birth, it was a collection of wooden shacks with a few stores along the main street. We don't actually know who Patrick's father was. He was baptised using the Christian name of George Heenan, an Irish Catholic who Annie married shortly after Patrick was born. But George probably wasn't Patrick's biological father because while his name was on Patrick's baptismal record, it doesn't appear on his birth certificate. He seems to have been one of those poor young fellows who kind of fell between society's cracks. And a mother who made a marriage the family didn't approve of, and she came from pretty well-heeled middle-class circumstances, at a time when that really meant well-off, financially and socially well-off. Cut off from Annie's wealthy family, she, George and Patrick leave New Zealand in 1912 and travel to Burma. These days it's also known as Myanmar. When Patrick is just two years old, George dies, and Annie is left to raise him alone in Burma for the next ten years. This is back in the day when Burma was part of British-controlled India, and there's a strong Burmese nationalist movement agitating against British rule. The famous author, George Orwell, worked as a policeman in Burma at the same time Patrick was living there. Orwell wrote a novel based on his experiences in Burma called Burmese Days, which he used to express his disgust with British colonial rule. Your whole life is a life of lies. Year after year, you sit in Kipling-haunted little clubs, whiskey to the right of you, pink and to the left of you, listening and eagerly agreeing while Colonel Bodger develops his theory that these bloody nationalists should be boiled in oil. You hear your oriental friends called greasy little baboos, and you admit dutifully that they are greasy little baboos. You see louts, fresh from school, kicking grey-haired servants. The time comes when you burn with hatred of your own countrymen, when you long for a native rising to drown their empire in blood. Of course, uh, Orwell's one of the greatest literary analysts of the British Empire ever produced, but uh, if he could see it, then surely people like Heenan would be picking up on these same vibes, to use a word. What seems to be most serendipitous is how this animosity against the British Empire and this sense of solidarity with Indian nationalism, how that gets translated into deciding to throw your lot in with the Japanese. We'll come back to Patrick's links with Indian nationalism and how that links to Japan in a minute. I should also stress that we have no real idea how 12-year-old Patrick's experiences of colonial Burma affected him. He didn't keep a diary. His mother never spoke to anyone about it. But there's another thing that's worth mentioning. Multiple people who knew Patrick describe him as looking sallow-skinned or Mediterranean. 
Patrick might have been what polite society of the time called mixed race. If he was, maybe that explains why he might have felt more sympathy for Burmese and Indian nationalists than your average European. On the other hand, George Orwell was 100% white and you just heard him dreaming about a native rising drowning the British Empire in blood. Anyway, despite her tough financial circumstances, Patrick's mother wants him well-educated, so she travels back to England and pays for him to attend the prestigious Cheltenham College. She didn't want him to fall down that social economic ladder. She wanted to maintain that sense of, this is my level in society and this is where we belong. So there was some scrimping and saving to send him to schools that she really couldn't afford. And as a result, he was always the kid who had Uh, the oldest and tattiest and most out-of-date shoes and clothes and the scruffiest appearance and got teased about it a lot. And uh, the sources, what we know, all suggest that that had a a fairly predictable effect on a young adolescent boy. It made him resentful, made him quite a scrapper. I mean, he wasn't a small lad. He didn't get picked on, quite the reverse. And uh, clearly entered manhood with a big chip on his shoulder. Uh, Where exactly he got the idea that this was all because of some uh, vicious class snobbery generated and fed by the British Empire as a kind of institution, we can only guess uh, from his mother, from people around him, but that certainly seems to have informed the young man's worldview or outlook on life. Cheltenham College was well known as a school with a military focus. It fed the officer class of society. Any animosity Patrick might have had towards Britain didn't stop him, like many other students, wanting to make his career as an army officer. He does very well in physical pursuits, he wins awards for boxing and swimming, but he's held back by very poor grades. In the end, he fails to graduate. He's only eligible to become an officer thanks to a letter of endorsement from his headmaster. And he joined the Indian Army because, of course, he wished to be an officer, he wished to hold a commission, But it was cheaper, it was more affordable for those who didn't have private means to soldier in the Indian Army than in the British Army, and he went that way. Patrick's social troubles don't end when he joins the Army. There's quite a lot of evidence he was disliked and bullied by his fellow officers. A big part of that bullying is down to Patrick's poor scholarship, but it may also have had something to do with his appearance. The fact that, as we mentioned before, he didn't look 100% white. That was a big deal in the British Army of the 1930s. The touch of the tar brush, as the old derogatory phrase went, uh, certainly seems to have lingered on him. All of this just seems to have made him more inclined to um, take a particular attitude. And that may well be an explanation as to why he decided to adopt the cause of Indian nationalism, if I can use that phrase, as something that personally interested him and that he wished to invest in. Uh, We can see the connections forming in his mind. These are people who are pushing back against the British Empire, against its snobbish and racial attitudes that seem to have uh, given me such a hard start in life. And I I sympathize with their cause and their problem, and I think I will attach myself to it. I'm just surmising here, but it all seems to have some foundation in what we know about the man. There's quite a bit of evidence that Patrick befriends Indian soldiers with nationalist leanings and speaks out against the racism which is endemic in the British Indian Army. But this animosity doesn't seem to stop Patrick from being a good soldier. He sees his first combat in 1939, just a few months before the beginning of the Second World War. The British Indian Army has been fighting in this area for decades as they try to suppress Pushton raids and rebellions. This was... Probably the longest running and most familiar active service commitment of any ground force in the British Empire. And there was a particular uh, escalation of all of this in Waziristan, of all places, in the mid-1930s, when one of the local political religious leaders, the Fakir of Ipi, tried to orchestrate a revolt and provoked a British response, which eventually required considerable force, a couple of divisions. It was a by far the largest military commitment in terms of ground fighting that the British armies made between the world wars. And Heenan, like every other officer in a combat unit in the Indian Army, not surprisingly uh, rotated in there and saw some time there. Patrick Heenan's biography, Odd Man Out, includes a quote from an unnamed officer who saw Heenan take part in one particular battle where Indian Army troops were forced to attack Pushton fighters entrenched at the top of a steep hill. 
The objective which Bee Company had to take was an extremely difficult one. Almost vertical rock surfaces, hills hundreds of feet high above the open ground, which had to be covered before reaching the formidable objective. Heenan, who was either the company commander or second in command, I can't recall which, was always in the forefront of this attack, which I could observe clearly from where my C Company was in reserve, awaiting the second phase of the attack. I can remember at the time being impressed with the determination and the courage with which the successful attack was executed, and this certainly included Heenan. By all accounts, he seems to have done his job rather well. Yeah, absolutely. The unit did well. Uh, they carried out their mission without undue casualties. The whole operation was fairly well conducted, as an example of, if you want to use the phrase, counterinsurgency. But indeed, it looks like he held his end up. What his fellow officers don't know is that while he's taking part in this attack, Patrick Heenan has already been recruited as an agent of Imperial Japan. Exactly how this happens is unknown, but it's most likely it happens when he goes on leave and travels to Japan in 1938. I mean, ask yourself the obvious question, why go there in the first place? That, that wouldn't occasion any interest today because air travel is so easy and it's such a good destination. But the, the idea that unless you were going there to study the language or the culture, which a few did, that somebody such as him with some spare leave time and nothing else to do would pick Japan of all places to go to. I mean, I would venture to guess that he would have been the only one in his professional social circle who did any such thing. So if, if that wasn't where he was either recruited or developed, then I fail to see how else it could have happened. And the fact that he went to Japan in 1938, after open war had broken out in China, after the confrontation in Shanghai, the sinking of the British and the American gunboats, after the massacre at Nanjing, and the really visceral turn of opinion against Japan, uh, that, that would be quite remarkable to explain any other way, unless he was pursuing some developing agenda. The other really big question is why? We've already heard that Heenan had some sympathy for Indian nationalism, but it's hard to see how that translates into support for Japan. Up until around the 1920s, it wouldn't have been unusual for Indian nationalists to be pro-Japanese. That's because back in 1904, Japan went to war with Russia over territorial disputes in Manchuria and Korea, and to the shock of everyone, Japan won. That was a sensational event. It had a terrific impact in nationalist circles all over Asia, as embryonic as they were. It was the first time that anyone could remember that in a really major confrontation, an Asian power had defeated a European power. And it did have an impact on an entire generation who looked to Tokyo for inspiration and support and sustenance. So initially, Japan was seen very positively by Indian nationalists, but all that changes in the 1920s and 30s, because in those years, the Japanese empire was involved in some bloody and horrific wars of conquest in China, which looked a lot like the kind of bloody horrific wars of conquest which European imperialists had engaged in. There's also the Nanjing Massacre, where Japanese soldiers murder tens of thousands, some say hundreds of thousands, of unarmed Chinese civilians. The appearance of how they were conducting themselves in China and operating there uh, did not go down well among most Indian nationalists who certainly wished to see the end of the British Raj, but didn't necessarily wish to exchange from one military-dominated empire to another, not if it entailed buying into that kind of behaviour. This all makes Patrick Heenan's allegiance with Japan really hard to understand. It just leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Was it an ideological treason? If so, it's a bit of a sort of roundabout kind of one, isn't it? It seems to be more a response to bullying, doesn't it? He was made to feel like he didn't belong. Clearly poisoned his outlook on life forever. How many human tragedies have we seen get right out of hand and drag so many others down because of bullying? And one wonders if they weren't just the only game in town, the only people who went to the young man and said, we understand these are your concerns and sympathies and uh, we feel for you and we think we may have something useful that you're interested in. What do you think? 
It's hard to explain any other way. I mean, there's no ideological attachment. There's no racial attachment, if I can use that word. And the idea that the Japanese Empire would be the instrument of ending the snobbishness and racism of the British Empire seems a bit far-fetched even for that time and place. Ultimately, it's impossible to say for sure why Patrick Heenan turns traitor. And an even more thorny question is coming up next. What did he actually do when he was acting as an agent for the Japanese? That's coming up in next week's episode. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. The sound engineer is Mark Chesterman. As always, you can find more Black Sheep at the podcast page at rnz.co.nz. You can also find lots of great other RNZ podcasts there. May I recommend a new one, Eating Fried Chicken in the Shower. Comedian James Nokise has a chat to all kinds of people about their experiences of mental health and personal struggle and how they overcame it all while sitting in the shower eating fried chicken. Also, don't forget to subscribe and give us a rating for Black Sheep. Also, tell your friends about it. It's the best way to get the word out. Cheers. Bye now. The holidays are coming. Find a gift for someone special with jewellery from Blue Nile. Right now, Blue Nile is offering special Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. Save up to 50% on the season's most stunning trends. Blue Nile offers an endless selection of bold gold styles, gemstone jewelry, and classic diamond pieces. And now, for a limited time, get 36 months special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com.